Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hey, this is Michael Lappin from Nuix, and today we're going to uh, really take a look at sort of an in-depth examination of early case assessment. We're going to talk a lot about analytics uh, and also uh, technology-assisted review. Something fun we're going to do today that we don't always do on a Nuix broadcast is we are going to have three polling questions. You guys will all be asked as attendees to vote, and you'll do that on your screen. Shouldn't be too hard. It's just some kind of interesting questions that we'll we'll go through and see how everybody's responding to some of the important topics of the day around early case assessment. With that, let's get into some introductions. So yeah, I'm Michael Lapham, Director of Solutions Engineering. And Newark's been here about four years. I started out doing e-discovery in 1992, which was uh, well before there was an e on the front of it. And I met uh, my esteemed co-panelist in about 2007 at the EDRM consortium. Uh, George Socha, of course, is the co-founder of EDRM and seen it through uh, about uh, eight, nine years now. And um, so we're very, very eager to hear his thoughts about early case assessment. He has some amazing uh, treasure chest full of war stories and anecdotes, which I'm sure he'll, if we behave ourselves, share with us today. George, are you there? I am, and uh, thank you for letting me join you for this. And by the way, Michael, I got pulled kicking and screaming into e-discovery right about the same time you did. <laughs> and now look at us. Where have we been and where are we going? So, <laughs> what has so, today, uh, so today hopefully we're going to explore uh, you know, some of the things that we've learned and maybe a little projection on where we're going to go around e-discovery and early case assessment. TAR, Technology Assisted Review, uh, and early case assessment will be sort of the topics that we're mostly going to focus on. Uh, analytics are very important. They empower us a great deal, uh, as they do in some other industries, which we'll kind of uh, dabble in uh, briefly. Uh, we're going to introduce a scenario today that uh, takes us through a semi-real-life sort of scenario using the old Enron data set to show us how analytics can really uh, get us where we're going very, very quickly. And then what we'll do is we'll close out with George's top 10 practical tips around today's early case assessment. Okay, so let's start out the fun with a polling question, guys. What I think uh, we want to talk about first is, um, do you believe that early case assessment and technology-assisted review can be bundled together as the same type of functionality? Go ahead and vote on your screen, guys, yes or no. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Uh, we know that we have some pretty spirited arguments. Uh, I know George has written and talked a lot about uh, the differences. Uh, how similar are they? And, uh, is there too much distinction to bulk them, you know, to bundle them together? I'll give you guys just a few more seconds to get through answering yes or no to that polling question. Okay, let's see what we got. Well, I am definitely in the minority. <laughs> yes, that is interesting. <laughs> Okay, it's not exactly what I thought either. So, hey, I'm glad I showed up today. I'm learning something already. Let's get into this, uh, this technology of Citra Review. Uh, George is going to help us slay this beast. George, what exactly is TAR? Well, let's start out with what is one of the standard definitions for TAR. And I'm not going to try to read all of this. You can read it for yourselves. But the basic idea is that you use a specific technology to take a look at a set of materials, or rather you look at them, give them a thumb up or a thumb down, and anything you give a thumb up for, it tries to find more things like that thing you gave the thumb up for. Now, we can go to the next slide. There are a variety of tools that are used in connection with technology-assisted review to facilitate it. So let me Actually, back to the previous uh, slide, uh, that gets right into the TAR versus analytics view. The description here for TAR is really what people talk about as predictive coding. Go to the next slide, what you see are other forms of technology-assisted review that are not predictive coding. They are different things, looking for items that are nearly the same to each other. That's not a thumbs up, thumbs down approach. That's a technology driven approach. Email threading, where you pull together similar pieces of information. 
then we get to predictive coding, which is just a subset of the different forms of technology-assisted review, and clustering, which is one of the older forms of the newer forms of uh, technology-assisted review. So the older, older forms are things such as looking for files that have uh, the same or similar dates, looking for files with the same names, looking for files with similar extensions, things like that. Clustering actually uses various forms of technologies to put together materials that, according to the parameters you set using those technologies, seem to look alike. They might put them together in folders. They might show them visually as related to each other. There are a number of different approaches for that as well. So we've got a subset for the coding, but then other forms of technology-assisted review. Well. Right, so George, you'd say then it's it's safe to say that predictive coding is simply a subset of the tools and descriptions of right. what technology-assisted review is, right? Okay. Right. So definitely not synonyms. Technology-assisted review, in turn, is not the same, I think, as early case assessment. Quick distinction, early case assessment versus early data assessment. Early case assessment, right when you get the case, how much do you think it's worth? Who should work on this? If you're inside counsel, do you hire outside counsel or use your own uh, people? That is their insurance coverage. All sorts of issues that don't have to do with the data you're going to need to look at necessarily. Really, data assessment is focusing on the data you think you're going to need to deal with. Think of it as EDRM writ small. You grab a small portion of the data, you process that data, and you start evaluating that data using various forms of technology-assisted review to try to figure out what this case all means and what you want to do about it. Got it. All right. That's a lot. I'm a lot clearer now. Thanks for that, George. So let's uh, let's get into our, our scenario that I mentioned. I sort of introduced this a little bit. What we're going to do with the the Enron data set is we're just going to we're going to take a look at a, a fictitious price-fixing accusation. Um, we have gathered, uh, collected, and processed uh, four main custodians that we've decided upon. Um, and the defendant uh, is going to look at this data and see what kind of risk there is within the data set that we already have and, and, and sort of analyze any exposure that may be present. It may or may not be actually related to the price-fixing accusation. We might find things that come up that are dangerous on their own. Um, we sort of have a desire to limit the scope, as we always should, as much as we can to protect ourselves and decide how soon that settlement conference is going to come up for us. So with that, I'll take a look at a, actually a piece of a new technology briefly. You see on the screen I've got four of our uh, favorite um, EDRM, or sorry, Enron custodians up there. We're going to focus a little bit on Philip Allen today, which is uh, not who we usually focus on. It's usually the Ken Lays and the, and the Skillings and some of those people. But you can see what I've got. I've just got some simple analytics that shows for what for these custodians, we've collected some things. There's some email. There's some office docs. We're talking about attachments, maybe some embedded objects, sort of the, the usual group of data for each of these uh, people. Um, so just a simple overview. When we look at these things in a grid view, we can start to see things that might jump out at us according to maybe a piece of metadata, maybe the name of the file, something like that, uh, that might draw our attention to you know, something that might, we might find interesting before we even get started on anything uh, you know, highly complex, right? Um, I'll just keep drilling in here. I've actually got a, a bit of permission granting that I've done for a reviewers group here. And if you see down on sort of the bottom right, we've got a list of words is one of the analytics tools we'll explain in a little bit. A list of words we're going to run across this data set that might also bubble up some more interesting things, right? So we're starting to just sort of get ourselves ready here to do some real early case assessment and deploy some, some strong analytics. Um, those keywords from that keyword set, set will pop up and they'll be highlighted. So again, drawing our attention, drawing us into the story. And then we can, we can continue to sort of assign value in larger sets or subsets for our expert reviewers to take a look at. The data that we've collected, of course, is remaining in place. It's safe, it's secure, and sound. Uh, and the web console can allow us to you know, go through this uh, pretty quickly and pretty easily. Now, 
The plot is going to thicken shortly around our scenario, so don't worry. We're just getting started. But what we want to do now is we want to go ahead and throw out our second of three poll questions around early case assessment. So which early case assessment techniques do you all in the audience primarily use? Now, this is a multi-select. You guys can choose one or more of these. And they include near deduplication, email threading, predictive coding, and clustering. So we've talked a little bit already about these, what they are, how they're defined. So that should help guide you just a little bit. Uh, these are all very, very useful. Uh, I wonder really how pervasive they are out there. I'll give you guys a few more seconds to answer uh, this one. A little bit more complex than the last one. I bet you you guys all use all of these these days. Okay, so let's let's take a look at our results of our 81 attendees vote here. All right, so we've got some okay. interesting. Predictive coding is not so popular. At wow. 30%. Okay. Okay, still not clustering still not about half. With that. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Actually, it's not surprising. I think we're still very early days with predictive coding. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty, and, and a lot of opacity. Yes, uh, yeah. hopefully we can help get people going in the right direction today. I think that'll be one of our sub goals. Okay, well this is good stuff guys. Thanks for voting. We got one more of those left. So let's go ahead and move on. Now what we see here is a picture of George's purple brain. Now I don't know <laughs> whose brain this is, but the question is, George, do you think that the human brain is Still the most effective discovery tool? Pretty rhetorical question. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. George is the other. You, you cannot plug in data to one of the other tools, any of the technology assisted review tools we're talking about. Push some magic button and have magic and miracles occur. Someone has to use these tools. Someone has to apply judgment when using these tools and figure out what insights really come from the use of these tools. So, yes, so you're saying we still have jobs, right? <laughs> so you're saying, George, you and for I... For now. Okay, we still have jobs. All right, good, thanks. Whew. That's a relief. Okay, Second so... Next week. <laughs> okay, we will do. Things are moving fast, you say. All right. <laughs> okay, so take us through another little bit of tar before we get into some more traditional ECA. So... There are, first of all, many variants of TAR as it's being talked about here, which is primarily predictive coding. So this is, if you will, a generic approach. Any tool you use probably will operate a bit differently from this. But for this to all work, someone still needs to look at something. You can't just pump documents into a system, press a button, and have it figure out everything for you, nor do you want it to do that. You've got to take a look at documents to try to figure out what things you think matter to you. For better or for worse, you end up with a flat view of a document set, meaning you don't really see the interconnections between different uh, files, because we're really talking about files. You don't see links between them. Some files draw data from other files to make them operate. You don't see a nested structure or the clustering of the files even in how they were used. One of the things I've long liked to do is take a you know take advantage of tools that let me look at the folder structures where people store information. There's a ton that can be learned from that but only if you do it in context. Pull it out, put it into TAR, and it's much more difficult to figure that out. Um, TAR continues to be a very ineffective way for you to be able to figure out trends. Even if uh, you are scaling down using a, a predictive coding from 10 million files to 50,000 files, no one, or 10,000 files, or 1,000 files, no one's going to look through the 1,000 files and be able to figure out all the various trends they care about. You need other tools to allow you to do that. Same, again, with relationships and connections. And, and as well, gaps in the data. Um, do you have a chunk in a time zone where there's nothing? 
whether you should do you think there should be something? Uh, is there a complete absence of a certain file type? Things like that you're not going to find here. So TAR is a good way to speed up the review process, but it doesn't always help you with the analytical process. And let's wow. move on from the other one. That's a great quote right there. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that to memory. That's a good one. Okay, so let's let's go back in time and let's look at um, traditional early case assessment. Now, this is not, by the way, everyone. This is not a picture of George's office or my office, but it does resemble some that I I've had before. Uh, let's go back to the old days when we were talking about discovery before it had an E on the front of it. Uh, when you were beginning your practice, I had bait stamp ink all over my hands, um, working in the basement and stamping records and paper records. Uh, tell us about um, early case assessment and, and, the, and the scenario that I know you want to speak about around the warehouse. <laughs> and, then, yeah, and then maybe you can comment on um, yeah. where we went wrong with electronically stored information in regards to that scenario. Okay. I mean, uh, so a portion of the traditional early case assessment was figuring out what to do with all the paper you had. Often we had a mythical million cases. Someone was saying, we're going to have a million pages or a million documents, and it would turn out to be 10,000. But once in a while, you really did have a million. And that could happen where, for example, you walked into a massive warehouse at the southwest corner of the warehouse. That happened to be where the door was. The first time you went through this exercise, if there wasn't someone seasoned to guide you, you might have tried to work your way from the southwest corner of the warehouse systematically over to the northeast corner of the warehouse, opening every box, looking at every folder inside every box, looking at every document in every folder, every page in every document. You never would have completed your trip through the warehouse, and you probably would have missed the things that mattered most to you, even if you by some happenstance stumbled across a few of the things, you wouldn't have had a good idea of the lay of the land. So the second time through, or if you had someone experienced to guide you the first time through, you might have taken a very different approach. Walked in the warehouse, tried to figure out whether there was an organization to how the materials were stored there. Were insurance records over here? Were, um, uh, product development files over there, or personnel records yet over there, figure out which one you thought you cared about most, which group you cared about least, and, and prioritize from there. Go to a, care, a group you think you care about, flip open a box, rifle through the content, <coughs> rifle through the contents to try to get an idea of what you were doing, and so on. You wouldn't zigzag your way through the whole warehouse. And you would never look at everything that was in the warehouse because you never had the time or the money to do that. But it gave you a chance to fairly quickly zoom in on the things that most likely were going to matter most to you. And of course, you would miss key things, but that was unavoidable. So where did we go wrong? We went wrong by buying into this notion that once it's electronic, you have access to everything and instant access to everything, and you can search it all instantly, and the search engine is going to find everything you want. None of those are true. You still won't have all enough time and enough money to go through everything. You still need to figure out ways to prioritize and focus in on the things that matter most to you. What you do have and what you did not have in the past are a whole series of tools, analytical tools, that help you in that effort. Tools that are the counterpart to getting the lay of the land of the warehouse, the counterpart to flipping the box open, the counterpart to rifling through their contents. And so we can jump to the next slide because now we're talking about analytics. And what do we mean? There are different definitions for analytics as well. Here's a very broad one that comes from the EDRM site, and it's intentionally broad, and it's evaluating your ESI you know, for its content and its context, including looking for key patterns, topics that matter, people, discussions, anything and everything you can think of. 
provided you've got the tools to let you do this. And there are a variety of tools. We've grouped together a few things here. There are many more than this, but these are some of the more um, interesting in a way, uh, and not so much the, the more prosaic communication mapping. There are various different ways that allow you to get a visual depiction of communications between people and often allow you to zoom in, zoom out, look for connections between a certain person and a certain other person, look at one person, to whom that person communicated with, typically via email, but there are other forms of communication as well. Timeline mapping are great capability, especially if you've got one that once again lets you zoom in and zoom out focus on a specific area. You can find gaps. You can find areas that seem to be of great interest to looking at this. Named entities. Uh, and, and this is a more technical approach, but it's going to it can help you do a much better job, not just of identifying who individuals and who organizations, as well as who anything else you can define, you might be looking for, but normalizing these and, and searching for and grouping them together much more effectively. And then conceptual searching. And conceptual searching is especially valuable in helping you do one of the key things that analytical tools can help you do that the predictive coding tools by themselves have great difficulty doing, which is help you find the things you did not even know you needed or wanted to find. Just looking for more of what you already know about won't get you there. If you map things out conceptually, you can start to see connections that had never occurred to you. You can start to get placed before you concepts that you hadn't realized might be important to you. So using these and a variety of other tools can help you greatly. So let's go to the next slide, which takes us back to the first polling question in a way of ECA versus um, um, whatever we had on that polling collection or question, ECA and TAR, whether it can be bundled together with the same type of functionality. So take a look at what we have on the screen here. On the left-hand side is a screenshot of some of what you can find. This is one of the communications networks. And it's a screenshot of, uh, I believe, the Enron, yeah, it's the Enron data used um, in Newix's platform. It's very rich in what it offers you because you can see an individual, you can't read any of this text here, it doesn't matter. You can see an individual, see what it's highlighted in yellow, there's an individual down there, connections that individual has with other individuals. But then you can see off a connection to yet another individual, connection that individual has elsewhere. If you were actually in the tool, you could realign things, you could zoom in, you could change parameters, there are all sorts of things you can do to help you get a pretty detailed and nuanced understanding of what was going on between people. That's an analytical capability. On the right, we've got our EDRM, Computer Assisted Review Reference Model, or TAR model, if you want to call it that, or Predictive Coding Model, if you care to call it that. Um, and this represents a typical and fairly common approach to TAR. But I've got this up here as well, because there's some things TAR is not going to do for you. First, it probably would not find this diagram. This is a diagram. It's not a string of text. It might be in there as a JPEG, it might be in there as a GIF, but it's not a string of text. Second, even if you convert it to text, chances are whatever optical character recognition tool or intelligent character recognition tool, whatever you're using, uh, whatever you're using wouldn't find all of the text here either because you see that circle on the right-hand side where you've got predict results and then test results. Chances of it finding and translating the part that says text results into a string of text that says text results are pretty low. And then even if it did capture, that technology captured all the text, it would not capture the difference in the, the, the pattern, 
which you see with the chevrons, it wouldn't capture the different colors, orange to red to purple and so on, all sorts of things that you wouldn't happen. So if you just click through the next couple of points on this slide, and we're talking about, you know, there we go, the limits of technology assisted review, the data that can't be there, and it's not going to capture necessarily the metadata involved with it, or even if it does, it may not mean anything to you. So, I'm not saying TAR is bad. It's got its role. It can be very effective and very useful for its role, but it's limited. And there are a whole host of other analytical capabilities. And by the way, analytics is not something new. We in legal are not known as early adopters of technologies. If we go to the next slide, we can see that the use of analytics is well established in a number of other industries, marketing, marketing. We could go with any number of examples, politics. We're going to see more and more of that over the next um, uh, year until we hit the uh, next presidential election. And even process improvement, people are digging into data and corporations and other organizations in all sorts of ways that we haven't even really begun to think about in the um, legal arena, but which we ought to be taking a close look at. So what are some of our ECA analytical tools? We've got various forms of statistical analysis. Um, and, and, and all sorts of ways of using that information. If you uh, make extensive uses of Excel, Excel you probably use pivot tables and pivot charts in Excel. Those functions can be used in, in a much broader way and with other tools as well. We can use tools that let you work with date ranges. We can go on to the next slide and, and use tools that help you evaluate the text itself putting together um, lists of words, using shingles. Shingling, and I won't try to go into an explanation of that here because we don't have the time for it, but it is the technology that underlies many of the predictive coding tools in, in use out there. Um, named entities, where we've got all sorts of things, credit card numbers, company numbers, social security numbers, any number of things that can be worked with. And then, as I've talked about before, the communications networks, we saw an example in the earlier slide of that side by side with our car diagram, and link analysis, where you're looking at um, that type of information as well. There are a host of additional tools, and these are just a few examples. So, with that, I'll turn it to you, Michael, for our third polling question. I got a couple of a couple of comments though on um, what you said, George. You know, one of the things that I, I see us using analytics tools for are not just for honing in on things that are important, but also distinguishing huge quantities of redundant, outdated, and trivial information. So let's let's yeah. do the converse of what you're saying and say let's use shingling to exclude. Let's use uh, word lists to analyze things like newsletters and use the word unsubscribe to find some of those and get those out of our view so we don't waste time on you know, large quantities of data that are absolutely useless when we uh, investigate them. So that's another big part, I think, of analytics. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, you know, it sounds like from your summary there that the analytics tools are, you know, real life tested ways to keep us from going insane when we're out there in the warehouse that you talked about. And then the technology assisted review helps us in other ways. It helps us uh, shift proportionality conversations and things like that that sort of make, make new options real for us. Uh, not necessarily how we do, you know, review entirely, but definitely can be of assistance to changing the game just a little bit. Okay, so per George's instructions, let's see if we can't get to the last of our three polling questions here. So again, vote on your screen, guys. This is a no wrong answer here. Pick one or more. Uh, are you guys currently using any of the following analytics tools in your discovery processes? Uh, we've got pivots, date range or trend timelines, shingles, named entities, communication or link analysis. I know we're using quite a bit of this at Nuix. Uh, our link analysis is real big uh, in things like uh, incident response, 
Um, we're looking obviously at, at some of these these tools uh, for our, our more in-depth practitioners. You know, some people that are are fairly savvy will will understand how to use things like shingling. Uh, it feels like these three uh, are or these five are a little bit more uh, esoteric or elusive than the first ones that we asked about. So I'm interested to see uh, how everybody's going to vote here. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds, and then we'll have um, have the results on the screen. Let's go ahead and post those and see what we get. Oh, okay. Well, this is consistent, I think, with yeah, um, yeah. the earlier answers of the very mm -hmm. low use of shingles ties with mm -hmm. the low use of predictive coding. Yeah. And probably some yeah. folks who don't even realize that shingles is part of what's going on there. They go hand in hand, right? I can see that as well. Yep. Pivots, yeah. I can see that as well. Named entities is an interesting one that we use a lot in compliance, you know, tech governance exercises. Um, one of my teammates who I think is, is listening in right now, he and I did a project with a large well-known insurance company where we had to cleanse uh, an archive of credit card numbers, and we found a lot of them. But they also had legitimate business records um, talking about insurance policies. There were also 16-digit numbers, and being able to tell the thousands of each apart was very important. So named entities, it seems to come into play when people are looking at PII and, and looking at um, that kind of analytics rather than just, you know, reactive e-discovery necessarily. Okay. All right. So we're, we're getting there, guys. Let's, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about more about this scenario uh, that I introduced earlier. Um, let's, um, let's talk about how we might drill down into the data set for the four custodians that we have. Uh, I've seen some pretty savvy operators out there, practitioners of various analytics tools that can, what we say, pull the thread on an investigation. They can very quickly and easily find themselves right in the midst of uh, some very, very interesting and very compelling data. So I think that's what we're going to do, and we're going to use just a, a simple one. We're going to use uh, call me as a phrase that we're going to search. The idea here is that when people want to take their discussion offline, they say, call me, right? And that's when we don't want a written record in our email, call me, is what people say. So that's a pretty easy one. So take a look at a couple more screenshots here of um, Newix Web Review. Here's a simple analytics landing page for our case of uh, four custodians. Uh, it's the Enron data set, 46,455 items. Some simple analytics diagrams just sort of sort of helping us get a flavor, really, a texture of the data that's in there. Of course, it's emails and attachments, a few other items, compressed files, some embedded objects in our pie chart. We can see that very easily, pretty intuitive. Uh, and then we can also see that uh, we've got a date range that uh, you know matches the Enron data set, of course. Uh, things start to grow around 99 and start to slow down in 2002 and 2003, of course. Um, what I can tell you about this is it's, it's pretty intuitive, right? There's a, a high level of ease of use here. Uh, a lay user can do this stuff. A corporation can, can, or corporations can do this in-house. They can do it every day. They can be proactive. They can surveil. They can do early case assessment before there's even a case, right? So that's that's sort of the point here. So let's let's pull on the thread a little bit more. Let's put in our little search term right up there in the search interface. And let's throw call me in there and hit return and see what we get. Okay, we get a bunch more emails and attachments, of course. Same sort of timeline, but we've already already gotten down from 46,000 items to review to a pretty manageable 535, which isn't too bad. Keep on going. Let's add a let's add a custodian chart. Let's throw our custodians on there and see who we have. Of course, Philip Allen, the third one over. It's almost exclusively email, and we're gonna we're gonna use a hunch and just drill down into into his email just a little bit and see what we get. Now here is that network diagram, that communication network diagram, laid out for you so that you can see who Philip is talking to. There's a lot of people that he's emailing with here. He's communicating with a number of people. Many of them, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but many of them are, in fact, you know, Enron employees, as we would expect. He's doing business as you would expect. But if we look at, uh, take a look at some of the outside email addresses, we've got this domain, austin.rr. Now, domain sorting is one of the more powerful things you can do for not only finding lots and lots of useless junk, you know, finding the New York, New York Times.com emails and throwing those out, but also emails like this that uh, seems to be interesting. It, it, it seems to reference some sort of transfer of some money um, to a man named Larry, Larry Luter is his name, by Philip. Well, this may be meaningless. This may be just Enron business. 
And we're not entirely sure. So let's go ahead and sort our data by Philip and his outside email domains. Who is he corresponding to outside of Enron? And we see you know, a group of 10 or so different domains here, and we see another one that seems to be uh, associated with the same domain as, as Larry, and that's a CB Press. You see on the sort of the top right here of our network diagram. Well, who is that person? Not really sure. Um, let's take a look and drill down into those emails between those two people. So very quickly, we're now looking at what appears to be a very large monetary amount. And so all we have to do here is just sort by named entity. You know, let's look for money amounts. And we find a $10.5 million project. Uh, it looks to be referring to some kind of land or a site of some sort. Some builders are mentioned. Is this Enron specific information? Uh, I don't know if this is an Enron project, but that's a lot of money. So let's, let's talk about this. It looks like some kind of real estate transaction that might be going on. Further into this, we see um, Larry and Philip corresponding, another monetary amount of $1,500. Could that be some sort of a commission, some sort of a payment that this guy is going to receive? Well, it turns out in real life, guys, Larry Luter is a, is a mortgage broker, and this correspondence has to do with uh, the Bishop's Corner real estate deal. Go ahead and Google that if you've not heard of it. And it looks like um, Philip is trying to arrange a way for Larry to receive a payment for his, I guess, assistance uh, or compliance with regard to uh, looking for or purchasing and developing some land. Uh, may not be Enron business, and that's the kind of thing that we're discovering here. Is Larry using Enron dollars? He certainly is using Enron time and resources and email to correspond with this person. So you see within literally just a matter of seconds, we're pulling on this little thread and we're doing some analytics and we're finding the right box in that warehouse that might uh, you know, might get us somewhere. It might actually be taking us in a, in a direction different than our original intent, but you can see that analytics can be very, very powerful, you know, getting you where you need to go. Okay, so guys, we're, we're almost in the home stretch here, actually. Our timing's pretty good. Um, what I think we should do is we should have George take us home with 10, his top 10, uh, practical tips around today's early case assessment. So with that, George, explain this for us. Sure, and this is just the top 10 of today. It could be a different top 10 tomorrow. But, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, um, one of the things to take a look at are the types of files you're dealing with. So you start out early on, you grab data for custodians, Michael mentioned as an example. Um, Dump that information in a tool that lets you get a sense of what file types you've got there. Take a look at them, especially if you can figure out a file type by count. You probably will see a lot of what you expect to see, but you might see some things that you weren't looking for or didn't anticipate would be there. And it could be worth your while to sample those, take a look at a few of those, see what you're dealing with. Similarly, if you've got the capability, try to find the different languages used in the files that, that you have gotten your hands on. If you have a population with a significant number of files that are not just in English and Spanish, which we would expect more of, but perhaps German, Korean, Portuguese, uh, Arabic, you may need to start to think about how you're going to approach dealing with that population of data. You may or may not have capabilities to work with that data. You may or may not have people who can read that information. And machine translation, although it's gotten a lot better, still has a long way to go. Look for issues within your data sets, the things that seem to have gone wrong. These could be things that have gone wrong because they were right when you got your hands on the data, but by the time you got to the point where you could start looking at the data, something had not been processed properly, and you need to go back and reprocess the data. Or these could be things that were wrong, in air quotes, in the data from the get-go. Uh, are there gaps? Uh, do you not see the things you should see? 
you know, an, an obvious example, you grab someone's hard drive and you don't see any files. Uh, uh, that you would expect you see a whole bunch of files that contain nothing but the character X or you know, there are more uh, insulting ways of doing that with some of the tools people use out there. That's going to tell you something right away. Um, take a look at the dates, not just date ranges, but also take a look for invalid dates. Are there a series of files that um, according to their metadata were created in the year 2026. That could tell you something, or it could be not that important. Are there gaps? I keep coming back to gaps. Are there gaps in the, the data that tell you, here's something I should pay attention to? Or conversely, are there spikes, a huge number of files or communications or other things that are happening in a very short time period? And are there outliers? Do you have a whole bunch of dates in one area, and you've got a blank, and then a bunch of dates later that are small compared to the overall group, but still large enough to pay attention to? There are so all sorts of things. Saying. Yeah. Or, or yeah. not necessarily missing data, but an, another little collection of data that might be of interest to you mm -hmm. that you might want to go take a look at. Mm -hmm. Keywords can be used in all sorts of different ways. Um, you can use them to help find custodians. You can use them within custodians any number of different ways. And topic mapping, clustering, whatever you want to call it, things that help you make use of the technologies that show you um, concepts within the files. All of that can be a, a very powerful set of tools. Now let's go to the next slide. Back to what Michael was talking about with entities and named entities. There are all sorts of capabilities there, both to find things you're looking for as well as things you weren't thinking of, but also, as Michael had suggested, as a way of dealing with problematic sets of information social security numbers uh, and the like, or identifying sets of materials that you want to set aside and probably won't do uh, anything further with. There are all sorts of relationships that can be found within data. And we could spend a day just talking about the different types of relationships and what you might be able to do with them. But the most important first step is to look for those relationships see what starts to come up, and then try to figure out what to do with those. Back to keywords. Um, a couple of things to look for. Uh, one example is misspellings. I used to, uh, when receiving discovery requests in the set of cases I worked for, I know this is only by analogy, but I would look for misspelled words and then patterns of misspelled words because that would often give me the ability to figure out which plaintiff's firm had shared information, usually under protective order that wasn't supposed to be shared with anybody, with which other plaintiff's firm. And then it would give me not just that knowledge, which wasn't really that useful in and of itself, but more importantly, it would give me some insight into who was talking with whom who might be sharing thoughts about strategy and how I wanted to deal with those two apparently unrelated firms where I could tell by identifying the spellings that they were actually working together. You can do the same type of thing looking for misspellings and data at, at, at a different level. Use analytic tools to reduce the noise getting rid of so much of the chaff so you can focus on the wheat. One of the things you can do, for example, is to use tools that allow you to um, identify and work with skin tone as a way of finding personal photos and setting those and the, the email messages containing those or whatever it might be off to the side in those situations where you just don't care about and don't want to or need to deal with that information. And then finally, uh, use mashups. And one example of this was a case I worked on. We ultimately went to trial on this case. 
where it, it took a number of court orders, but we got the other side's databases. Some of them are structured databases, some of them are only loosely termed databases because they were really lots of text that hadn't been normalized in any fashion. We took all of that, normalized it. We had uh, ma manufacturing databases, uh, supplier component part databases, uh, installation databases, customer complaint databases, sales databases, and then we got some of our clients own databases, threw that all into one system and then started querying the system. And what we did with that then was took the plaintiff's theory of the case and converted it, literally converted it to a graph in Excel, you know, a line graph in Excel. If the plaintiff's theory of the case holds true, this is what the data should look like. Then we looked at the data, very complicated process to achieve this, especially because we did this a number of years ago. We looked at the data and mapped out the line we actually found, which was similar but significantly different from the data that should, the line that should have been there. Then we started exploring. What can we find that helps us put together a theory of the case that comes up with a line that more closely matches the line found in the data? Their theory of the case, our client provided a component part that they used in the stuff they sold. Our component part failed, which is why their stuff failed. Our theory of the case, or the theory of the case we found that was a much better match to the data, they were too successful, they grew too fast, and they lost control of the quality of their product. Interesting. Not an easy exercise, but it's an opportunity, and with today's tools, we could have done that so much faster mm -hmm. and so much uh, at, a, at such a lower uh, price point, at a lower cost. So these are a number of things you can think about doing as you start to use or make more extensive use of the various ECA capabilities, whether they are analytical tools, whether they are TAR, CAR, predictive coding, or whatever you want to call it. Um, using some or all of those can help you immensely in focusing in on your case and figuring out what to do about it so that you can do what you ultimately need to do, which is bring the matter to a satisfactory resolution for your client a bit quicker, a bit better, and a bit less, ex at a somewhat lower cost. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, thanks for that, George. So guys, we're just about in the home stretch here with that from George. Um, We'll do a little recap before we take some questions. I do see we've got a couple coming in on the chat window. So go ahead and start typing in your questions on the chat window, guys, if you don't mind. So we, we went over TAR today. We really had George define it for us, where it is today, what it means, and how that's different than early case assessment analytics. It seems to me that analytics play a, a different part than TAR. They both are valuable, um, maybe one more tested than the other, more uh, adopted. We saw, found from our polling questions, which was interesting. We know that lots of industries use various types of analytics for various reasons. Uh, we looked at and talked about some of the early case assessment tools and how do we use those. I introduced a scenario where uh, we were able to dive into some good old-fashioned Enron data and, and find some things quickly that might be interesting. And then, of course, George helped us with some, some practical considerations. So I'm going to go ahead and, and throw a couple questions. They look like, let's see. Looks like they're they're really uh, directed towards you, George. So you're on the hot seat okay. for another couple minutes here. Uh, the first right. one, you're okay with that? All right. So yep, the first one, manage. okay, is what kind of fatal flaws or gotchas do you see parties making in the ECA phase of an investigation today? I see three fatal flaws, and they are subsumed within that phrase, early case assessment. Fatal flaw number one, they don't start early. They wait until they've reserved data, gathered, you know, collected it out, processed it, gone through the review for relevance and privilege, and only then start assessing data. Not so good. Fatal flaw number two, the second word, case. 
early case assessment works only if you are assessing the case early on. If you are narrow in your scope and are only looking at ESI without thinking about the case more broadly, then it's not early case assessment, it's early data assessment. That might mm -hmm. sound like it's just semantics, but it's not. Right. A lot more than that. And finally, the assessment piece. I see people grabbing data early, running it through a system, but then not just not tying it to the case, not really assessing it. They're using it to try to streamline the review process, which is all good and important. It helps reduce costs. But they're not taking advantage of the greater opportunity to try to assess things, put together a hypothesis and test that hypothesis to see how well it holds up. And in testing it and watching it perhaps not hold up so, so well, have the opportunity to form a second hypothesis that might be closer to what you want. Or in litigation terms, it's finding and refinding your theory of the case or your story for the case. So it sounds like if it's it's not early case assessment if it's not early. And if you're just doing data analytics, which we were kind of doing in my scenario a little bit, right? We're just kind of seeing where things take us. It's data analytics. It's not case analytics. Right. And if you're not assessing it properly, you're not you're not really looking at the value of the data. Well, you're not assessing. Is that fair? Yep, that is fair. I almost get the feeling you've been asked that question before. Just maybe. Maybe so. Okay, so we got That's one nasty. more coming up here, and then I think we're going to be just about done. How long does a defendant typically have to complete these early case assessment steps as recommended, and what do they need to make it come together? So how long do they have? Never enough time. Right. Um, but I, mean, I, I know that sounds like a vague answer, but part of the challenge is that it, the federal and state courts don't operate all under the same rules. Even when you have one set of rules, federal rules of civil procedure, in many ways those rules are advisory rather than obligatory. The parties can choose to follow a different path often, or a judge even can in some situations impose a different path. All that said, you really want to be up and running and analyzing the data within the first week of, of trying to handle something. Not that you're going to gather all the data and analyze all the data. That's not going to happen. Not, not with early efforts. Think again, EDRM, writ small. You're getting some data. You're starting to get some handle on what happened and then you'll continue and expand from there. But you want to start as soon as you practically can. Gotcha. And Huge then, direction. Yep. You know, what do they need to, to make it come together? Well, you need some data. You need some tools to let you work with the data. You need some training for um, the ability to roll up your sleeves and figure it out yourself so that you can take those tools and use them in an effective fashion with the data. And of course, you need an understanding of the case as well. Otherwise, these activities are just done in the abstract and don't lead to anything of value. Gotcha. That's a pretty loaded question, isn't it? Yeah. OK. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm not seeing any more. You guys, any last questions for us? George, that was fantastic. Always great working with you. Uh, always have a lot of fun when we get together. Um, so guys, uh, find out more if you like. There's some stuff on the screen, some resources for you. Uh, I want to thank the audience. I think George does as well. Very much so. Thank you all for joining us. I hope it was worthwhile. Yeah, it was for me, George. I definitely learned some things. I've got to keep those definitions straight of what, what is TAR, what it isn't, what are analytics and all those things. So it definitely helped me. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Well, I think that's it for today. Uh, thanks again for joining. I appreciate it very much. Take care.